Good morning, everybody. Good morning to members, officers, and any uh, members of the public who are tuning in to this uh, meeting of South Cambridgeshire District Council's Cabinet. My apologies for being a few minutes late. Uh, you know, technology always takes longer than one anticipates. Um, so this is a hybrid meeting. Um, some, some members of Cabinet here in, in person and some other councillors here in person and officers and others attending, uh, attending remotely. Um, only those members present in the chamber are able to move and second motions and to vote. Uh, members present virtually uh, may, speak in the, may speak in the debate. Um, if you are participating remotely, please would you indicate that you wish to speak in the chat and Councillor Bill Handley will semaphore me, I think, uh, to tell me that there are people waiting. Uh, we'll take ca um, cabinet members present first as speakers, uh, then cabinet members attending remotely, and then um, we will go through other members uh, in um, whatever order they kind of appear, appear in. So, um, we also um, have Liz Watts, our chief executive here, and Rory, Rory McKenna, our monitoring officer. So we're going to start off with apologies for absence, and um, Jonathan, um, who have, who, um, what apologies for absence do we please have, Jonathan? Thank you, Leader. We have received apologies from Councillor John Williams and Councillor Peter MacDonald. Thank you very much. So those are, those are noted. Uh, do any members present or participating remotely have, a, have any declarations of interest pertaining to any items on today's agenda, please? No, so there are no declarations of interest. Uh, moving on to the minutes of the previous meeting, which are on pages one to eight uh, in, the, in the meeting notes. Um, are there any issues arising from the minutes, please? No? Okay. So uh, members are asked to approve the minutes of the meeting held on the 6th of September 2021. I move the approval of those minutes as a correct record. Um, I think Councillor Neil Goff is going to second that. Thank you. Do members agree the, to approve the minutes? Thank you. Does anyone wish to vote against? And anyone wish to abstain? No. So Cabinet therefore agrees the approval of the minutes as a correct record by affirmation. Um, section 5 is public questions. Um, to the best of my knowledge, we've received no public questions, but can, Jonathan, can you just confirm that's the case, please? Thank you, Leader. I can confirm we've received no public questions. Thank you very much. Uh, item six are issues arising from the Scrutiny and Overview Committee and Councillor uh, Judith Rippeth is participating remotely. Uh, she's uh, Deputy Chair of this important committee. Um, Councillor Rippeth, do you want to speak now or would you like to speak um, at the relevant items on the agenda? Can I speak at the relevant item on the agenda, please? Thank you very, very much, Councillor Rippeth. That will be fine. I will do my best not to forget. Uh, and moving on to item seven, issues arising from the Climate and Environment Advisory Committee. And we have Councillor Pippa Haling, who chairs that important committee. Uh, Councillor Haling's, would you like to speak now or would you like to speak at the relevant points in the agenda? Yes, at the relevant point in the agenda. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much indeed. So moving swiftly on uh, to item eight, which was creating a vision for the Oxford Cambridge Arc. Um, Possibly should have declared that I sit on the leaders group for the Oxford Cambridge Arc and I'm the lead member for the environment for the Oxford Cambridge Arc. Uh, so there is a consultation that's live at the moment and the council is, um, has prepared a response to go into that. And I'm asking Councillor Toomey Hawkins, who leads on planning, to introduce the report and move the recommendations and I am happy to second it. So Councillor Hawkins. All right. Um, thank you very much, Chair. Um, the, the report before you this morning um, sets out the joint response um, to the Oxcomer consultation on their paper, which is titled Creating a Vision for the Oxford Cambridge Arc. Um, this consultation is being undertaken to inform the approach to the future of the Oxcomer Arc, which government has identified as a key economic priority 
um, and to guide the future growth of the area to 2050. I will say that the consultation seems to have been designed uh, primarily for the public, and there's not enough detail, I think, in it for local authorities to do it full justice. However, we are giving it as much of a uh, detailed response as we can with the detail that is available to us in the public domain. Um, I think I'll just mention one thing. We know that water is a critical issue um, in Greater Cambridgeshire, and we believe that um, it's part of the potential of the R is to play a key role um, in acknowledging the impacts of water abstraction from our chalk aquifers and um, kind of hopefully propose uh, solutions on a regional basis to address this issue. And not just that, but also um, energy provision. Um, Cambridge, uh, the, the Cambridge City have at their uh, recent meeting um, given this joint response uh, their consideration and they want to make some minor changes. And so um, what I would like to do, if I can find my notes, is to uh, move that we agree a joint response with Cambridge City Council to the government's creating a vision Oxford Cambridge app consultation as set out in Appendix 1 and giving delegated authority to the Joint Director of Planning and Economic Development in liaison with the lead cabinet member for planning policy and delivery to make minor amendments. Thank you, Chair. Yeah. Thank you. So I, I'm happy to, uh, to second the, uh, the amendment, which uh, since you're, you're proposing it, uh, doesn't, need to be vote, doesn't need to be voted on. Um, so, you know, this is very much, uh, if I may speak as seconder, please. Um, this is very much directed at members of public, as uh, Councillor Hawkins uh, said. I gather there's been some tens of thousand uh, responses to it, and I gather the government's very pleased with that, uh, especially as a lot of those responses are from people who don't normally participate in consultations on things. So it shows how, in, how important this is, and obviously there are uh, some millions of people affected by it. Um, so, do any of members of Cabinet wish to comment on this? Uh, we don't, because the amendment's been proposed by Councillor Hawkins, um, who is moving the, moving the recommendation anyway, it doesn't need to be voted on. Okay? Yeah, okay, that's, that's fine. So, are there any, any questions from Cabinet members? Any questions from anybody else, either in the room or participating uh, remotely? No. Okay. So I will just uh, I'll just read out again what the recommendation is: to agree a joint response with Cambridge City Council to the government's creating a vision for a vision for the Oxford Cambridge Art Consultation, as set out in Appendix One and giving delegated authority to the Joint Director of Planning and Economic Development in liaison with the lead cabinet member for planning policy, lead cabinet members for planning policy and delivery to make minor amendments. All right, um, so do members agree with that? Anybody wish to vote against? And anyone wish to abstain? So cabinet therefore agrees the proposals by affirmation. So moving on to the main item of this morning, and that's the Greater Cambridge Local Plan, the preferred options, brackets, regulation 19. And again, we're going to come to Councillor Toomey Hawkins to introduce the report and move the recommendations, which is quite long. All right, um, thank you, uh, Leader. Um, Local plans are important documents for identifying development needs of our area, where they should be met and how they should be met. We need to respond to the needs of our area, otherwise we will be letting down our communities. We don't want to do that. People need to be able to live in the area and work locally, and that includes our teachers, nurses, doctors, drivers, hospitality workers, electricians, plumbers, many uh, who already live here or have to commute into work here. We are creating jobs across all manner of sectors, but it's no good to provide jobs 
of no homes. We are in a good place. We already have a lot of high quality development planned and in the pipeline. Communities like Water Beach and Nosto, plus land already identified in earlier plans along with other sites, adding up to some 37,000 homes across Cambridge City and South Cambridgeshire. We only need to add about 11,500 additional homes during the coming decade for us to meet our needs in full. Now, informed by a large amount of evidence and testing, we have identified new development proposals which would focus development where it provides opportunities for cycling and walking and access to high quality transport. Now, two of those major site proposals are Northeast Cambridge and Cambridge East, which are cross boundary sites for both authorities. Preparing a joint plan has allowed us to consider the strategy choices available and determine the best strategy for the Cambridge area, rather than being guided by arbitrary lines between the city and the South Thames district. Cambridge City Council have confirmed their support for the first proposals at their Planning and Transport Scrutiny Committee on Tuesday. And focusing new development on these key areas not only protects our villages from inappropriate development, but it also is the right thing to do for our climate and our natural green spaces. It focuses development on places where you won't need a car to lead your day-to-day -day life. And clearly, most of our villages don't meet this priority. So protecting and enhancing the environment is also a key part of these planned proposals. We have been very clear that water is a real deal breaker. We need action from the industry and government to sort this out. The proposals will set ambitious targets for building standards to help us on our very important net zero carbon journey. Our green infrastructure mapping project has also led to a set of pro projects that can be invested in towards achieving our doubling nature vision. And it must be remembered also that these are our first proposals and it is not yet a fully drafted plan. And community engagement has been key to getting us to this point and we now want to engage again and to do this, we will use innovative digital approaches through our website, through webinars, and with face-to-face -face events focusing on hard to reach groups. So we would like to encourage people to please take part and give us their views. We can only do this together. Thank you, Ida. Thank you very much indeed, Councillor Hawkins. Um, I'd like to ask uh, Mr. Stephen Kelly to uh, speak for a bit uh, about the importance of having a plan that is sound um, and you know the consequences of not having a plan that's sound. Thank you. Uh, th thank you, Leader. Uh, yes, the, the um, purpose of, of uh, the requirements uh, in the National Planning Policy Framework and the way uh, that uh, local plans come forward uh, is uh, obviously well, we produce a uh, document, we consult and engage with the community, uh, and there is a very substantial body of evidence uh, which we rely upon uh, to justify that the plan is both uh, deliverable uh, and uh, a, a, a sensible response uh, to the issues that, uh, uh, that the area faces. Um, it would be easy in some respects uh, to take uh, the route of least resistance and to uh, rely upon um, uh, evidence uh, or, or, uh, or to seek to gain the system to uh, reduce uh, some of the difficult choices that we're going to have to make. Uh, but um, we have, uh, my job, uh, my, the job of my team, uh, is to give you the best advice we can uh, to delivering a sound spatial framework uh, on behalf of our communities. Uh, and um, 
whilst uh, we have seen a lot of commentary about, for example, the generation of the housing figures for this area, um, we, both from the experience of the 2018, what became the 2018 adopted local plan, of course you'll recall uh, that plan uh, spent some time looking at the issue of housing need, uh, which unfortunately held up its progress. Um, but, uh, uh, and from uh, the Spear report, uh, from the combined authority, but it was an independent economic review, uh, we have taken the measure uh, of looking very carefully uh, at the evidence that we can bring to you, uh, and indeed that we can use to help justify the council's position when it reaches, uh, when the plan reaches the all-important examination. Uh, and the reason um, why uh, we uh, are making uh, suggestions uh, around things like housing numbers that don't necessarily correspond with national um, uh, figures uh, is because uh, this area is quite distinct and unique, but is also because the consequences for not uh, uh, exploring these matters now uh, are delay uh, in the longer term and particularly delay later in the process. Uh, it's important for our communities that they can feel confident as we go forwards with the document uh, that uh, we are being robust uh, and that we are looking to try uh, in uh, as much as we can uh, to present to them a real picture of what is happening uh, in Greater Cambridge uh, and that the evidence that we have published, an extraordinary amount of evidence as you can see from the attached, helps those communities in turn to also challenge us, uh, review the evidence for themselves, uh, and uh, participate fully uh, in that process if, if they wish. So there is a lot of, there's a lot of information uh, uh, here today. Uh, we have taken uh, the step of publishing a huge amount uh, of background information, uh, starting with the first conversation uh, around the Corfa sites. Uh, and sharing with the community uh, all of the issues that we are trying to deal with, both through the workshops uh, and through the um, evidence that we have published. Uh, the document is now something that we want to secure people's views upon, uh, and it's a document uh, with all of the evidence that we fully expect to be challenged uh, and um, uh, questioned about. Uh, and the team are ready to do that. We've got a forthcoming engagement strategy, which we hope using both digital, uh, so online, uh, but also really importantly where we can face-to-face um, -face encounters. Uh, we want to talk to the community about what we've published and we want to help them uh, to uh, understand uh, and indeed ask questions uh, and challenge uh, the final outcome. Because it's through that process uh, that we will end up with the best plan for the area that we possibly can. Thank you. Thank you. Um, could I just um, ask you just to uh, give a bit more explanation about the recommendations of the Spear report, which was obviously independent, albeit it was uh, commissioned by um, the combined authority and the mayor, about uh, which was, I think was proposing far far higher levels of growth than is actually being supported in uh, in the document we're discussing today and what the other recommendations of Spear were and the grounds for those? Uh, yes, certainly. Uh, I mean, we haven't solely relied upon any one source of, of information, but uh, as you rightly say, the uh, combined authorities' independent economic review is, is an important um, uh, uh, contribution into the discussion around uh, the right growth levels and indeed what needs to happen alongside that. And it... it makes the association or the connection between uh, economic growth for the area as part of the devolution deal and the consequential implications for housing numbers. Uh, and uh, the independent commission looked at the sources of data that are used conventionally for planning purposes, uh, including um, uh, information from, from ONS and so on, and the way that that data is cascaded down or translates down uh, from a regional to a, a, a local level. Uh, and uh, it encouraged local authorities across the combined authority area uh, to take a critical view of uh, the um, uh, data itself. Uh, and indeed, one of the recommendations, uh, recommendation five was quite clear about encouraging authorities to be uh, appropriately uh, considered 
in their uh, adoption of, uh, of uh, national economic data. We have, we have taken that advice on board. Um, uh, our evidence base for those interested in reading it will see the discussion and indeed the work that we have done uh, to uh, reach a conclusion at this stage uh, on um, the economic growth forecast and in our case what that means for housing. Uh, and, um, and we want to hear what other people have to say about that now. So um, we think we're being prudent. My advice, uh, you know, as your planning, uh, as your chief planner, is it's important in the context of documents like that, which will form part of the examination process without a doubt. It is important that we uh, can uh, confidently and robustly defend whatever the right figure is, uh, whatever the final figure is in the plan uh, uh, for examination. Um, but it's important also to get it right for communities because we do not want to reach the tail end of this process, uh, reach an examination process that we cannot then proceed upon and face scenarios as previously uh, of considerable delay in the examination process so that we are unable to, for example, demonstrate that we have an up-to-date local plan uh, and the consequences for that uh, in local areas where uh, perhaps more up-to-date up government policy uh, prevails uh, against local ambitions set out in a document such as this. So we've reviewed the uh, we've reviewed the spirit. We do our consultants uh, and uh, officers do not agree uh, with the forecasts necessarily contained in the spirit uh, as uh, credible for this part of uh, Greater Cambridgeshire uh, at this stage, uh, and we've set out why uh, why that is the case. Uh, we now want that. Uh, we'll propose it, uh, subject to your, your uh, consent, that we test our conclusions and our evidence uh, with our communities and with uh, those wider commentators, uh, including, no doubt, the combined authority. Thank you very much indeed, Mr. Kelly. That's very helpful. Um, Councillor Neil Goff, I believe you're going to second this item. Uh, would you like to speak now or later? Thank you very much indeed. Uh, so if I could call on uh, Councillor Judith Rippeth to speak on behalf of the Scrutiny and Overview Committee. Thank you, Leader. Um, the committee were largely supportive of the plan, which puts sustainability front and centre, addressing the fact that we are in a climate crisis. We were reassured to see that development um, so new homes within the next local plan is planned for in or around the city of Cambridge, close to places of employment or situated in locations with good transport links. We had a very long and detailed discussion, as you know, and quite rightly, with many points largely encapsulated within the report. However, there were a couple of things I just wanted to add from a couple of members of the committee. Okay, firstly on EV charging points. Um, Councillor Chung Johnson made quite a good point, which I think needs um, picking up on. She says, I would like to add my appreciation on the forward thinking targets for EV charging charges on development. However, residents are concerned about the potential for charging cables to be crossing pavements, so want to understand the rules we can put in place to prevent this. And secondly, um, Councillor Steve Hunt also um, talked about gas. Um, he was glad to be able to, sorry, apologies. He says it's unclear that all uses of gas, I'm afraid I'm going back to his email because I couldn't quite um, remember exactly what he said in committee. It's unclear that all uses of gas can be easily replaced with electricity. And so if no new development should be connected to the gas grid, includes commercial or mixed use development, then that may be challenging for what kinds of businesses can operate there. It may be that by developments, it's intended to mean specifically housing developments. And if so, then that could be perhaps be clarified 
by saying dwellings instead. And a further point he makes is we mustn't discount the possibility of non-fossil fuel gas like biogas becoming an important part of the fuel mix. It won't be a won't it be a problem if we build lots of housing that gas pipes don't reach. Um, in in summary, we were glad of the committee to be able to help shape this next local plan at this first proposal stage. I think that sums up pretty much the thoughts and feelings, and we were pleased it was ambitious and forward-looking. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Councillor Riffith, and um, my thanks to Scrutiny, who did a very, very, well, I know they put masses of preparation into this, but it was a fairly uh, mammoth meeting as well, um, and um, a very, very good debate. Um, I just wonder if I could come to, uh, back to Mr. Kelly on some of those additional points about uh, EV charging and about um, fossil fuels in, uh, in new housing. Um, I've got a feeling that some of these are kind of sort of national issues, but I just wonder how we will be able to accommodate those extra points. Well, can I um, jump in sort of non-fossil fuel gas? Of course, thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Leader. Um, I think, the, as you can see from the from the document itself, what the, what the um, uh, consultation is about is we're identifying areas, um, uh, particularly when it relates to individual policies, uh, of approach. Uh, and seeking to set out an approach. And the comments uh, that, that we've received are, are, are precisely those that really we're seeking to kind of draw out through this, through this process. That there are practical um, considerations as we frame future policy uh, that um, uh, Councillor Ripper has, re has referred to that we um, will no doubt form a part of shaping the precise wording. Um, in relation to the, to the points around um, uh, uh, gas connections and so on. Uh, I, I think that's something that we, we probably will need to see how national circumstances evolve over the time. Of course, uh, regardless of the source of the gas, there may well be uh, carbon emissions arising from it. And clearly, uh, I think we're likely to see these matters explored uh, further as the plan progresses uh, through to um, its final uh, adoption. Uh, but they're, valid, they're valuable contributions. Uh, and whilst I wouldn't propose amending what you have in front of you on the back of it, uh, I'm almost certain that we will uh, see other similar contributions and be able to evolve the policies that ultimately come from this uh, accordingly. Uh, thank, thank you very much indeed. So, uh, so my thanks again to the Scrutiny and Overview Committee for the considerable amount of work they've put into this and the value that they've... Uh, they've added to it. I'm now going to ask Councillor um, Pippa Halings to um, expand upon the feedback that we had from the uh, Planning for Environment Committee, who uh, <laughs> straight, straight after the Scrutiny and Overview Committee um, took part in this marathon and again provided very, very useful feedback. Thank you, Councillor Halings. Thank you very much, Chair, and, and through you. And yes, it was fantastic to be um, present at the overview and scrutiny. Um, I was online and then to the um, Climate Change and Environment Committee meeting immediately afterwards. First of all, what the committee did was to um, really appreciate the huge amount of work that had been done. I'd like to thank Councillor Dr. Toomey Hawkins for her leadership around this, but also the officers. And what we did was to recognize the huge amount of evidence on which these preferred options have been based and that this has been led by work um, by the Climate Change and Environment Committee from the very beginning, um, even from sort of late 2018 and early 2019, with the declaration of the climate emergency and the setting of the net zero carbon targets um, that was followed by the zero carbon strategy and then by the declaration of the ecological emergency, followed by the doubling nature strategy, which is sister document to that. What these did were to direct and shape um, all of the focus to the local plan process because that's where we feel we have most of our influence as a, as a district. And so there were very specific um, directions to um, the council and to our planning officers about what we want to see. And that then led to this huge body of evidence which is 
was noted as being groundbreaking, and groundbreaking particularly around the water management strategy um, document that was looked at, which is integrated, um, and as Councillor Dr. Toomey Hawkins has mentioned, has provided, you know, for the first time really, what is evidence to show that there is a constraint to meeting housing need. We have the housing need, but there is a constraint to meeting that housing need, and that needs action up front, um, and that, that's the space we are in. Um, but also a bespoke net zero carbon study, which for the first time is looking at the carbon implications of each of these spatial strategy options, and has therefore led to looking at more of the buildings in the allocated sites already, which are Water Beach, um, Northstone, and Bourne, and very, very few houses in the villages. And that's on the climate change implications of that, as for a whole host of other implications. But it's, you know, the evidence is there to show us um, that we need it. And then the green infrastructure study, which is, which is absolutely fascinating and does give some hope indeed for building it. But it's all based on meeting that housing need for all of the people that need the housing, that Councillor Dr. Tony Hawkins mentioned, with the balance of sustainability. So the comments that came from the committee, I'd just like Chair to, to mention a few of those. And that was to recognize that in the preferred options, and this is still at consultation stage, so we still need to really hear from, from everybody, is that we are setting higher carbon standards for housing than is the current government standard. That's, that's quite incredible. We are also setting higher biodiversity net gain targets in the preferred options than what is expected in, in uh, the environment bill. So that is at 20% rather than the 10% which is expected in, in the environment bill, which is soon to, um, to come through Parliament. However, we do feel that there's a key issue, and that's around flooding. And Obviously, most of our residents and parish councils, and as we've seen at most of the planning committee meetings, this is an issue which is you know, hugely important and difficult to deal with with the current policies that we have around, around flooding. And we do have some um, wording that we would like to propose. And that is for the proposed policy direction, CC slash FM, flooding and integrated management, and that is that development must demonstrate it is resilient or adapted to flooding. And flood management policies will ensure that the risk of flooding in the area is not increased as a result of new development. So it's not just the actual application in front, it's about the wider area too. So any kind of imp um, impacts on that. So we would like to see um, that, that wording considered. Also in terms of active travel, we would like to see it more innovative the government has come out with a new decarbonisation of transport strategy um, in July 21, and it's going to ask local government to come up with local transport policies. So we would like to see in those more innovative approaches to active travel, and there was a specific request around the cycling links to be shown around the district. And finally, a very difficult issue, it's about the minimum access to open green space per, um, per resident, per number of residents. We know that it's mentioned in the preferred options, but we would really like to see this um, coming forward as, as some kind of policy around that minimum access. That ever, We just know how important it is for everybody's um, physical health. And so therefore, in policy BG slash EO, which is about providing and enhancing open green spaces, we'd like those to be mapped and to see about that possible policy of minimum access. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. It's interesting to hear you uh, reference flooding. I, I was in a, um, a conference yesterday with the chair of the Cambridge and Peterborough Climate Commission, and um, she talked about flooding and said that, I can't remember what the date was, but it was alarmingly soon, that uh, in our area, one in ten houses would be affected by flooding and one in four businesses if action wasn't taken. Uh, the other thing that she was very concerned about was uh, with, with um, temperatures going up, overheating and the potential for significant numbers of deaths of vulnerable people living in homes that can't be kept cool. Um, so that was very much on, the, on, on her agenda as well, and uh, she spoke very eloquently on that. Um, uh, Mr. Kelly, do you just want to respond to some of those specific asks and say how, how they will, at what point they can be accommodated? Uh, 
Um, uh, thank you, thank you, leader. Um, I think they're helpful. They're helpful suggestions. Uh, obviously, as um, uh, Councillor Dr. Toomey Hawkins highlighted, we have a um, period uh, subject to your uh, agreement of this document, where we will finesse uh, the. Uh, when we, we would expect to finesse it, ready for, for consultation. Uh, if there's uh, a, a feeling that uh, we move further towards the uh, the wording that. Um, Councillor Halings has, has suggested, then I'm, I would have thought that we could accommodate that uh, in terms of then uh, taking something out for, for, for consultation uh, in, on the 1st of November, which is our, which is our plan. That, that's that's marvellous. Thank you. So, uh, Councillor Toomey Hawkins, um, I'm assuming that, you know, if that's done in consultation with you, Mr. Kelly and um, Councillor Halings, that will, that will be satisfactory to you. Uh, that's correct, Leader. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. And thank you again for the attention that your committee has given to this. I know they put considerable effort into it and uh, your contributions are absolutely invaluable. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, so I'm going to um, open out the debate on this to members of cabinet in the first instant. I will come to Councillor Goff at the end as part of the summary before uh, Councillor Hawkins does a final summar summarisation. So, uh, any members of cabinet wish to speak on this? Uh, Councillor John Batchelor. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. Yeah. Um, well, I very much welcome uh, this uh, local plan. A um, couple of points uh, on the numbers. Um, my understanding, given the uh, level of development coming uh, expected in our area, this represents the minimum acceptable number that is likely to be um, uh, upheld by the government. Uh, we most certainly don't want to get it back into the mess that this council was in a few years back. Um, and uh, we have examples around us where um, ignoring government instructions does, as you know, good whatsoever. Uh, I'm, our near neighbours, Uttlesford, are an example of that. We should also remember that uh, homes are needed and uh, we should be proud of the um, number of affordable houses that we've been able to deliver, some of the highest percentages of affordability in the entire country. Um, and we will be doing that again and getting a, as close to 40% uh, as we possibly can. So, the, uh, as I see it, we are facing uh, the realities of our situation here. The growth is uh, inevitable, but at the same time, we are protecting the villages and we are maintaining the rural nature of South Cams. This, I think, is an extremely important I'm very happy to see this go forward to the next step and hear what our communities feel about it. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Batchelor. Our point's very well made. Uh, Councillor Bill Handley, did you want to speak on this? No? Any other members of Cabinet wishing to speak? Okay. Uh, I believe that uh, Councillor Richard Williams, um, who is online, would like to uh, say something. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sorry. I beg your pardon. Councillor... Williams, would you just forgive me a moment? I'd missed that uh, Councillor Milnes wished to speak. So if I take... Oh, you don't. Oh, right. So, no, sorry. Councillor uh, Williams, please go ahead. Sorry. I'm, people are pointing at me here, and uh, I'm not quite sure who they're pointing at. So please go ahead. Okay. Thank you, Leader. Thank you very much for the opportunity to, 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 to make a point. Um, I, I just thought I'd, I'd, I'd like to point out, as I'm sure everybody knows, but there were some... Um, questions and concerns from at least some members of the scrutiny committee um, ab about the methodology, um, particularly the um, effect or the disproportionate impact that the new methodology seems to have on, on, on the city and South Camps. And I, I don't want to rehearse those arguments today. We've, we've obviously had them, um, but I would just like it noted that there were some concerns expressed um, in scrutiny. And I'd also add actually that officers um, are very kindly offered to um, give a written response to those questions, um, which I've submitted and and I'm waiting for a response to. Thank you. Thank you. Um, does anyone want to 
Councillor Hawkins, do you want to just respond to that? I think it was, uh, it was a request that to, to note the debate that went on in scrutiny of overview about the methodology, and it's quite appropriate that that happened, and also acknowledge that Councillor Williams has been promised some further engagement and to know when that's happening, I think. Um, thank you, Leader. Yes, I believe we have uh, a response for Councillor Dr. Richard Williams, and I think probably um, I'm at fault for that because I actually read it yesterday <laughs> and um, was going to sort of sign it off and get it sent to him. So he should have that, I'm hoping, um, at the end of, by the end of today. But we do, we do acknowledge um, his, his comment. Uh, but what I will also say to that is that uh, when we were looking at the previous, um, uh, the previous plan, the current adopted local plan, um, the, the whole, um, I think part of that was that delivery was going to be um, front loaded in the city, especially for the cross boundary sites and then move into South Cams. So we're expecting fewer delivery in South Cams in the front end, and then um, you know, more as, as, as the uh, plan goes forward. And it's also why we had a joint housing trajectory presented to the inspector at the time. Um, so that is one of the factors which I think um, we need to make sure that is clear to everyone. Thank you. Yes, I don't imagine many places have more complex situations than that than we have here. Uh, Councillor Heather Williams, I believe you'd like to ask a question. Sorry, it logged me out and I'll have to log back in. Um, I won't take it personally with the machine. Uh, so thank you, Leader. Um, you'll be pleased to know, obviously, you know, there's going to be bits in here that we agree with and we don't agree with. I'm not going to attempt to um, rehearse those ahead of, ahead of when it comes through. I'm sure you'll be relieved to hear. Um, but there are a, just a couple of things in relation pre-consultation. Pre um, and I think uh, I, met, I think I mentioned this at group leaders meeting, so a leader would be aware that some of um, my parish councils in one of the previous consultations um, experienced some difficulties responding as a, as a group because... You had to go to get the next question. You had to go to the next stage of a new hat. So it was kind of geared up for individuals, which is, is great, but it didn't, it wasn't the easiest to use for them, um, considering as well that most village halls and things don't have Wi Fi or, or such things. So just asking if that can be looked at to try and make it as accessible as possible, even if we perhaps print the list of questions so they could you know, physically go through it perhaps to give a group response. So that, that's one thing. The other thing um, is just about keys for diagrams. So looking at page 76 and um, particularly like 69 as just examples, there are different colors which might be done for aesthetic purposes or they might be done for, for you know, genuine purposes. Or for example, the, we have um, orange buildings, gray buildings, dark gray. Um, it's very helpful to put some sort of key with the diagram, um, and I think that would particularly help um, people to understand exactly what, what things are. Um, I'd, I'd just like to say as well, with the minimum access to open space per resident, which Councillor um, Pippa Hayden's referred to, I think that's, that's an important issue, particularly as we've come through the pandemic. But I'd also say that we need to look at that being within a certain parameter of that person because we can have X amount of um, sort of square meterage per person, but it could be perhaps put in a country park, you know, way over the other side of the district. So we want to make sure that's in the locality of people as well. So that's something that potentially could just strengthen that. Um, and look, my question would be around whether Cabinet is proposing or willing to look at setting maximum density on site allocations, um, because I think... You know, there has been concerns raised previously, and I'm sure we'll, we'll be going forward um, about um, the level and how dense housing will be. So knowing if that is something the Cabinet are willing to explore as they go through the process and putting some maximum densities in, particularly on sensitive sites, would, um, would be appreciated. Thank you, Leader. Uh, thank you. Those are very helpful questions. I'm going to come start off with uh, Councillor Hawkins and then... Um, then uh, to Mr. Kelly, 
Uh, so three three questions really. Uh, will will we able just will we be able to just print out a list of the questions uh, so we can discuss them at parish council um, and we did discuss that at uh, group leaders meeting. Uh, can diagrams have keys as well and actually picking up on your point for, for people with some visual impairment actually who don't have the sensitivity of sight to see the colours that's a very good point. Uh, is there a, going to be a minimum de distance for being able to actually access some green space? And are we proposing setting maximum densities on sites? So starting off with Councillor Hawkins and then letting Mr. <laughs> Kelly pick up. Uh, thank you, Leader. Feels like I'm back on scrutiny. Um, okay, regarding, can I first ask about the page number that you quoted, please, Councillor Williams? Um, so I, there are others through, but there's page 76 and um, 69 were just two that I pulled out as examples. So at 69, you've got like a pink swirl, a green and a dark green and a light green. Um, and then you've, the 76 is the one where you've got the different colored houses. Right, okay, we will, on, we will. I'm on, I should say, I'm on the paper free, which as we discovered in um, planning means I've got completely different page reference <laughs> to okay. everybody else. Um, yeah, could we sort that out as well, please, leader? Because it, Makes you wonder if I've got extra or missing information. I think what I will do on that, if I may, for you, Leader, is actually just liaise with you to say exactly which images you refer to, and then we can take that on board and sort out um, the keys and things like that. Because um, definitely what I want to do is make it accessible to everyone. Um, point taken about um, list of questions. And I think I will leave the open space accessibility uh, to Mr. Kelly, but maybe make a comment on setting maximum density. What we want to do is have design-led uh, plan making. And I think if we were to go down setting maximum densities, we might be curtailing what could actually be great places on some of these sites. But I will let Mr. Kelly answer to that. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Mr. Kelly, please. Uh, thank you, uh, and thank you, Councillor Heather Williams. Uh, we obviously, in a sense, piloted with the first conversation uh, a digital approach, and we've learned a lot from that. So I'm, uh, I'm confident that it will be better uh, than last time. But of course, we want to help parishes who may well not have the technology. So I'm sure as part of our consultation packs, we can help make sure that there are helpful summaries for them to talk around the table uh, about as we go forwards. Um, uh, and uh, we are going through the document looking at um, its legibility uh, and particularly particularly diagrams. In terms of the open space uh, points that you made, it is an area of ongoing evidence gathering that we're undertaking because it is quite a complex uh, uh, area as we bring together effectively city standards and the approach in, in South Cambridgeshire. Um, but we're well, uh, we're very conscious of uh, the way in which COVID, for example, has, has, has really emphasized the importance of outdoor space for people, both for mental and, and physical well-being. Uh, and uh, as we go forwards through the consultation process, and as that evidence base matures, uh, we, hope to, we hope to be able to uh, capture what will be best practice as we go forwards. Uh, and and uh, really following on from Councillor uh, Dr. Tumor Hawkins's comments around maximum density, uh, I mean, I, I think it's right uh, to uh, treat setting maximum densities with, with caution there are different methodologies for measuring it. Um, but even in those circumstances, what we want to do with this plan uh, is to create design policies and a design process uh, that uh, recognizes local characteristics at a very um, uh, specific level rather than necessarily uh, the blanket uh, imposition of, of density standards, which in some cases has ended up with leftover spaces on site because um, uh, I think people can probably remember the, uh, the government's directions around minimum uh, uh, maximum density standards that ended up with uh, what they call, um, uh, I think, leftover space after planning, um, you know, these small pockets of, uh, of land. So um, we're keen to get the very best outcomes. Clearly, um, uh, the quality of the development uh, set out in our places elements of the policies, we're striving to, to push as hard as we can to, to create those distinctive local uh, and comfortable places. Um, we'll see what people have to say, though, in terms of the, of the consultation feedback. I mean, we're, we're, that's the whole point of the process is to gather a range of views and, and, and to 
to bring them to you. I think I do understand the concern about what the implications might be, for example, on densification of particular site allocations. Uh, and that is something that obviously I'm sure we'll look at further as we progress through the, through the process because we understand the anxiety uh, about what potentially um, uh, uh, people would be concerned about uh, on uh, particular locations or sites. Thank you very much. And of course, we have to wait and see what comes out of the uh, planning white paper, which seems to have gone back to the, the drawing board. Uh, that could be a game changer as well. Uh, Councillor Anna Bradman, you'd like to speak. Thank you, Leader. Um, and I, I'm very pleased. Uh, I, I'm relieved that the... Uh, well, my concerns came around um, water, both... Uh, sufficiency and what happens to it afterwards um, and I'm prepared to be assured by the assurances that are uh, around sufficiency of water that are itemized on page 27 of the first proposals document and page 41 so I'm, I'm prepared to relieve, be relieved by that um, and I'm very glad that my request that we should amend wording around flood resilience has been taken up and and picked up by the climate advisory committee and that's the wording that you will have that uh, councillor Halings has given you um, but the other aspect that I wanted to see if we could strengthen in any way because if we take an exemplar of the excellent planning um, that went into this development at Camborne um, right at the very outset the natural assets in the area were identified and mapped and protected right at the beginning. And then the areas where people could build were identified as, as parcels. And so what I wanted to do, sorry, paperwork over here, microphone over there. Um, what I wanted to do was to see if we could strengthen at all, and I don't, I mentioned it in scrutiny and overview. I, know, I don't know if it would be appropriate in policy BGEO, which is providing and enhancing open spaces, or um, <coughs> BGPO, which is protecting open spaces. But it's something around, right at the outset of developments, identifying natural resources at the beginning and requiring developers to work around and nurture those assets in a way that protects and enhances those assets for the people who will subsequently live in that development. Um, and if people want to take, uh, feel that's acceptable and want to take it on, then perhaps the wording can be finessed by officers. But I hope people would feel that's a, a good way to uh, um, and strengthen our commitment to it's kind of open spaces where. It's the natural assets within developments uh, that we can protect and enhance. Thank you, Leader. Thank you. I was going to refer that to Councillor Hawkins, who I think will probably want to do what she's doing with um, with uh, Climate Environment Group, and that's you know have a conversation and agree between you, her, and Mr. Kenny. But uh, Councillor Hawkins. Uh, thank you, Leader. Yes, I do recall parts of that discussion, and I have notes here in my. <laughs> my uh, document um, noting that so um, yes we will make you look at um, sort of work with you to have a look at that and see what we can do about it thank you okay thank you very much indeed um, I'm just going to invite to see if Councillor Cathcart wants to contribute because I know he sometimes has problems with his technology um, and since I can see him there and uh, he does normally like to contribute uh, Councillor, Councillor Cathcart do you want to say anything uh, uh, thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can. I don't want to talk about I, I, I probably welcome this uh, this plan. Uh, it, it's, it's, it seems to be sensible and innovative where necessary, and especially the environmental protections and enhancements, which are in it, I think, are much to be welcomed. Um, I pick up the point already made about local uh, green spaces. Um, it's often the smaller spaces that are actually highly valued and very useful to communities, as well as the big ones. So we just need to look at that and keep that in mind. Um, the other, I think I've probably mentioned the scrutiny committee, and over the years, the uh, protection enhancement of our, our, our existing high street 
parks and conservation areas has tended to be uh, somewhat overlooked in, in all the development taking place. And I'd like to see that would give good weight, um, not suggesting that the open consultants to be ordered, just as the plan progresses, we do sort of think about ways we can enhance our conservation areas and list buildings and the character and appearance of our high streets because they're very important to our local communities. Um, and I think that's something to be welcomed by people in our villages, as well as providing sort of a, a bedrock of, of, of a strong link to the past as the, as the plan how developments go forward. Many thanks. Uh, thank you, Councillor Cathcart. So it was quite difficult to hear, but I think I've grasped it's about, you know, your, your focus is on the, uh, the weight we give to conservation areas and our heritage, our heritage assets uh, in a particular listed buildings. Um, if there's any specific points you want to input, I suggest that you email them through to uh, Councillor Hawkins if you feel there's any uh, specific changes needs to be made to the wording before this goes out as a consultation. Uh, Councillor Hawkins, do you want to add anything there? Um, no, I, I uh, just want to appreciate the comments that uh, Councillor Cathcart make, uh, made at the scrutiny um, meeting, and I think also I've got my notes here um, on those, and I will liaise with him. Um, for the meeting. Fine. Thank, Fine. You. Thank, you. Thank, thank you very much indeed. Um, Councillor Handy, do we have any more questions from anybody? Yes, that's lovely. Thank you. I thought probably would. Uh, Councillor Milnes. Thank you, Leader. Uh, I, I just wanted to um, uh, mention, uh, because Councillor Bradnam uh, mentioned uh, agriculture and the, um, the water supply, and I just uh, and I noted in the Stantec report, on, on which we based a lot of our um, evidence um, for this issue, um, doesn't really um, spend a lot of time discussing the use of uh, or by agriculture. Uh, on the use of water. And um, on um, visits to meetings uh, of the uh, WRE or CP flow and so on, uh, we spend a lot of time talking about how to get rid of unwanted water and how to replenish the water that we do want. Um, but the um, agriculture on which we are really very hugely dependent in this area is a big user of water. And, and uh, there's a requirement, I think, in, in, um, in the short, medium, and long term to increase the reservoirs, for example, for agriculture as well as for uh, domestic use. So, but we've got limited input into what we can uh, get uh, um, the farmers uh, to do. So I think we, uh, I'd, I'd like to see some reinforcement of that issue. And just to give you an idea, beet and potatoes, uh, which are two big uh, crops in this area, require 300 litres per kilo of water uh, to produce them. Uh, if you go on to cereals, that's even higher. Oil crops, uh, even uh, oilseed rape. Pulses um, require 4,000 litres per tonne of water to produce. So the scale of the, the use from agriculture is really um, uh, critical in the overall context, and I'd just like to see that highlighted. Thank you. So that's really interesting. So this, this came up at yesterday's conference, and Baroness Brown spoke about it, and it was also discussed at this week's Combined Authority meeting as well, uh, that you know, we don't seem to be, you know, as, a, as a country, kind of factoring in the water use um, by agriculture. Um, I think I might ask um, uh, Mr. Kelly just to comment on this because, you know, is it our place to be doing this or is this, you know, a higher power? Uh, I mean, it, it is a good point uh, and I know it's one that increasingly is exercising um, uh, the Environment Agency and others and particularly starting to think about uh, with the water companies, their license renewals. I think it's probably the place in which Water Resources East, uh, Water Resource Management Plan is probably best place to set out a strategy. Um, we obviously need to keep a weather eye on it, but the level of influence that a local planning authority has uh, is, is very uh, modest in that area. Uh, I would, however, draw attention to um, uh, some of the proposals that we've got for the first time in the plan, which is to start to think about, uh, you'll have seen the green infrastructure work, we all, uh, and, and related to that, 
uh, is the work around biodiversity net gain and starting to try and identify those assets that potentially can be enhanced uh, as we go forward. And so within that, one would hope that the strategies and so on that fundamentally emerge uh, helpfully, I, I, I think, supported by a local plan policy that targets and helps to focus mines in, and landowners' minds in, the, in those areas, uh, we can engage with some of those kind of water resource uh, implications as part of that. Uh, and as we look to use um, constructively things like biodiversity offsetting contributions uh, in a proactive way, not only to help uh, ecological um, uh, and environmental improvements, but also to help manage the landscape. And we've talked about water and flood risk and so on uh, earlier on. So there are some hooks in our strategy that provide opportunities for, I hope, constructive conversations about some of these issues. But I would say that um, the environment agency uh, and the water companies and then bodies such as Water Resources East have a prime role to play probably in the management and strategy for that. Uh, although, um, given uh, I'm sure everyone's keen interest in the room on the, on the topic, we will look to influence and shape that as much as we can. And, in, and indeed, things like uh, through the OXCAM spatial framework, these are really important points to be highlighting uh, up into that work of government. Right. Thank you. And, uh, you know, we, are, we do participate in various platforms that can influence this. Uh, you know, the Ox Cambridge Arc, the Combined Authority. Uh, Councillor Bradham, I'm going to let you come back in because I know your professional background is in agriculture, so I'm sure you can contribute to this. Thank you very much, uh, Leader. Um, I was actually thinking of um, my role on and a number of members are role, have roles on internal drainage boards. And I just wanted to emphasize what Councillor Milnes mentioned because, you know, a lot of the uh, growers locally have abstraction licenses in perpetuity. These are non-rescindable licenses. And this is a balance that is, is, is well, it appears at first sight to be something unchangeable. So we, and, and with good reason, because of the requirements that Councillor Milnes has mentioned that crops have for water. Um, and anyone who sits on an internal drainage board will know that, you know, the, the at, at points when water supply is low, there is a, a, a delicate dance that starts uh, where first growers are asked in always anyway to do abstraction at night when there's less risk of uh, evaporation and then they're asked to restrict um, so it's a kind of courtesy arrangement <laughs> so you know, this is complicated stuff and I'm very glad to hear that we're um, responding to um, referring to the higher authorities because I think it is a really complicated issue thank you Thank you. It is, and actually it featured on the local news last night. There was a sluice running through Norfolk, and uh, you know, it was quite a long piece. It was on the ITV news. Uh, Councillor Halings, would you just like a quick addition to this before we wind up? Yes, and, and just bring it back into that, the, the overall impact. I was wondering how, within the preferred options, we look ahead also to the possible changes um, from one in 100 year events to one in 500 year events, so increasing the resilience. So Ofwat has just published a study, a consultation on this, and it was in the National Infrastructure Study and Report. Um, so are we also looking at, you know, changing that, which would also then mean that we're obliged to look at that wider wa water catchment management um, because we have to ensure that we can both absorb and um, provide for greater resilience, because it was a bit like the German government said, we've been planning for one in a hundred year events. We didn't really expect them to happen, you know, every 20 years. And so we're going to change our planning. And it looks like, you know, this is going to come up as well through Ofwat. Thank you. Um, Mr. Kelly, do you want to comment? Uh, thank, thank you, Lydia. Uh, yes, we have been talking to the uh, LLFA uh, in light of recent events around this very point in terms of the national standard of one in 100 years. Obviously, Scotland works to one in 200 years. I think the critical um, piece, as well as the assumptions around the factoring and climate change uh, implications. Uh, so uh, parts of the country uh, already have a slightly high, uh, have a higher um, standard, um, uh, Northamptonshire being one of them on the back of flooding events that happened there some time ago. 
uh, but we, it, is a, it, is, it is a conversation that we're having with the LLFA, and of course, you know, it will be DEFRA and others that are also part of that. But I think um, as the local plan process evolves, uh, uh, we will take on board uh, and look at this uh, very carefully based upon the, the, the latest, latest guidance. Thank you very much. Okay, so we're going to wind this up. I'm going to start with Councillor Goff as the seconder, and I'll ask Councillor Hawkins to uh, summarise, and then we'll move to recommendations. Okay, thank you, uh, <coughs> Leader. Um, so, um, firstly, I would uh, I'd just like to uh, congratulate the officers for a really impressive and substantial body of work here. Um, and court, you know, we've got the preferred options document in front of us, but um, to call that the tip of the iceberg um, is to underestimate the mass of background information and uh, data which is below the waterline and underpins that. So um, keep going, uh, Stephen, uh, Jonathan, Stuart, uh, Hannah, and those not on the call, um, you're, doing a, you're doing a fabulous job. Um, because this is a really important piece of work, and um, I think uh, for many in the community, it only becomes obvious how important this is when you don't have a local plan to manage development, particularly in this area. And oh my, we, some of us in our communities have experienced what that looks like, and it is really vitally important that we do not head back there. So what you're doing is also of critical importance. Um, I just wanted to uh, pick up a little bit on the discussion which uh, the leader and um, uh, Stephen had and was raised by Richard Williams in, Councillor Richard Williams in the um, scrutiny, which I think is a really important issue and I'm sure one which will get a lot of focus in the uh, consultation responses. And it's on what is really the foundation of this report um, around employment numbers. And uh, Stephen uh, alluded to the SPEAR report and the recommendation to the SPEAR report. Um, but I just wanted to dig a little bit further below those recommendations in terms of why uh, that was such a focus of the report, which hopefully will be helpful to uh, sort of members and any members of the public who wish to comment on this. Um, you know, the Spear was a really impressive uh, body of people and contained people such as uh, Professor Diane Coyle, who is really an expert in economic statistics, who I have a, a great deal of respect for. Um, and what they identified in that report was a real mismatch in some of the data and expectations around um, employment growth. And they, they, they said, and I'll quote from this, um, this discussion about employment growth is so important, uh, but more needs to be done to get to the truth. And I think that's the important point, the truth, because historically, from 2010 to 2016, they were dealing with uh, ONS data, which was 2.3% uh, annual growth, to uh, their own data, which they could, which is 4.2%. Over six years, that is a massive, massive difference. Um, and you know, the, the the work which um, the planning team has has, has done on this uh, to respond to that recommendation from the Spear. Uh, report in terms of further investigation of those uh, employment numbers is, is, is really, really important. And, and it's important because, and I quote again from what Spear said, um, is that you know, growth can be a curse if it's not managed well. That's exactly what they say. So if we underestimate uh, employment growth, there are no prizes associated with that. What, what comes with that? is going to be really difficult uh, environment and something which we will not have planned to manage. So uh, that search for the, for the truth is, uh, is, really, um, is really important. And, I, and I, I sort of welcome the additional evidence which has been collected there and uh, the importance of it. 
Um, I just wanted to, lastly, a, a, a comment on just, re, re, just a personal re reaction to sort of Councillor Heather Williams' comment about density. Um, and this is you know, personal experience. That, that density is really such a, you know, it's a, it's a fairly blunt tool. It's a very blunt tool, actually. Um, I've lived in uh, Maida Vale, which I believe is the most dense environment in the UK. Uh, and it's a great place to live. Um, because the place is so much uh, more than simply the density. And I've also lived in a place called Streeterville in Chicago, and, and the clue is in the name, Streeterville, uh, which was also an incredibly dense urban environment, but was a great place to live too as well. So I, I think that this, this, these preferred options are about trying to create places uh, which are which are much more than simply the uh, the density of the um, of the homes on them. And uh, again, I think uh, it is well laid out in the report, and I'm sure there will be lots of uh, good responses to the consultation. So, I'm in, in summary, I'm really pleased with uh, with this. I I think it's a great great piece of work. It uh, is a really important piece of work, and um, I will certainly be uh, supporting it. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Councillor Goff. Uh, Councillor Hawkins. Uh, thank you, Nida. Um, much has been said, so I wouldn't want to take um, our time, but what I want to uh, leave you with is to say to the entire planning policy team that's been working on this, a big thank you. There is still a lot of work to do going forward, um, and I know that many have been working long hours, silly hours, um, just to get us to this point. So a big thank you um, once again. And scrutiny and uh, the climate and environment um, action group. Thank you very much for uh, the grilling. I think um, it, it was uh, a long evening, but a good one. And I will just appeal to um, our residents to please get engaged because we want to hear from you. This is for you. Um, we have, as we've heard, uh, a lot of growth happening and will continue to happen. We have families who need space. Families are being created every day, every week. I mean, I've got two kids. They'll want to live somewhere, not with me, thank you very much. Um, and there are many more like that. Not to mention those who come to uh, work in the, you know, the various um, new jobs that are created. So uh, we want to hear from you. Um, we need to hear from you. We need to build together. So looking forward to hearing from you. Thank you, Nita. Uh, thank you very much indeed, Councillor Hawkins. So I would just like to add my thanks uh, to you actually and, and to officers and actually to say how very pleased I am with the way the preferred options document looks. So even though I know there are 10,000 pages sitting be behind it, and I'm sure a lot of you know, wrinkles and gray hair has gone into it, actually the, you know, the, the core document is beautifully presented. And uh, you know, one of our you know, first tasks when we came here was to get rid of what I called council speak. And actually, this is written in plain English. It's very intelligible. It's actually a pleasure to read. And you don't, you know, I'm not sure many people can ever say it's been a pleasure to read any document connect, you know, to do with a, with a local plan. But it's beautifully illustrated. It's beautifully set out. It uses beautiful language and is a thoroughly accessible document. Um, and so, you know, I think it's, I think it's a real, real exemplar. And that's absolutely down to, to, to our officers, and to um, you know, Stephen and Toomey's, Toomey's leadership of this. So my thanks to them, and I look forward to, uh, to more of the same. Uh, so there, I'm not going to read all the recommendations. There's various things to agree and note. They're set out on page 40 of the papers that I've got on my computer here. Um, so do members agree with the proposals? Uh, does anyone wish to vote against the proposal? And does anyone wish to abstain? 
So, Cabinet therefore agrees the proposals by affirmation. Um, you know, we very much look forward to encouraging our residents to participate in the consultation, which I have every expectation will be as high quality as the, uh, the original piece of uh, engagement work we did and will uh, reflect the, uh, the high quality document and the, uh, the brilliant work that's been done here. So, my thanks to everybody. Um, we've now reached the end of the agenda. Uh, thank you ever so much for joining us today to view uh, today's Cabinet meeting, if you've done so online. And I note the next uh, meeting of the Cabinet is scheduled to take place on Tuesday, the 19th of October, 2021, at 10 o'clock. So thank you very much, everybody. And uh, if we could stop the live stream, Lawrence, please. <laughs>